The six o'clock news starts right now. It will be up to voters tomorrow to decide whether certain aspects of the pandemic could ultimately change the Texas Constitution. Early on in the pandemic, visitations at nursing homes and assisted living facilities were banned to protect the people inside. Well, Proposition six on the ballot tomorrow would prevent that from happening again. Our Tiffany Huertas explains how the proposed amendment would change things. Not seeing her was devastating and it took time from her memory. She suffers from dementia. Not seeing her mother during the pandemic was difficult for Monica Alonso. My mother felt abandoned. She didn't understand why three of her children couldn't visit her. Alonso's mother, Maria Curiel Huerta, is in a local nursing home. And due to COVID-19, visitors weren't allowed for some time. Alonso could only see her mother through a window. She would keep saying, come in, come in, come in. And she didn't understand why. But Proposition 6 could change future situations like these for families. This amendment would allow residents of nursing homes and assisted living facilities to designate an essential caregiver who cannot be denied in-person visitation rights, even during a health emergency. The Texas Healthcare Association says it supports Proposition 6. The president and CEO of the organization says it recognizes the importance of in-person visitation. The good thing about the proposition is, is that it recognizes the importance of maintaining those relationships or maintaining that in-person relationship between the families and the residents. If Proposition 6 passes, the legislature would create further guidelines for facilities. It is the one thing that's right. And in fact, it's a shame that this wasn't put in place before COVID. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Election day is tomorrow. Polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Prop 6 is one of eight proposed constitutional amendments on the statewide ballot. There are also local municipal races and school bond proposals. For a full list of polling locations and a look at the ballot, you can go to ksat.com. The CPS Energy Board of Trustees announcing their new appointment for interim president after a vote today. This comes nearly two weeks after current president Paula Gold Williams and now she will be retiring from her position in January of 2022. The board appointed Rudy Garza as interim president and chief executive officer starting November 8th. Paula Gold Williams will stay on in an advisory role. Garza currently the chief customer engagement officer for CPS Energy. He'll serve as interim president until a permanent replacement is found. The board says they will retain an external firm to help with a national search. The U.S. Supreme Court is entering the conversation about what's been deemed Texas' most restrictive abortion bill. Today, the justices heard oral arguments about that bill. Our Courtney Friedman breaks down why legal experts believe this case could have some major implications nationwide. Well, what a great day for, uh, for Texas and for our system of justice. Two months after Texas enacted the most restrictive abortion law in the country, the nation's highest court is set to decide its fate. Lawyers representing abortion rights are arguing that abortion providers in the Biden administration has the right to challenge the law, while those from the U.S. Justice Department say the U.S. Supreme Court must step in to stop it from inflicting further harm. The latter being praised by Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton as he spoke to a crowd in Washington. And I was honored to be in court today representing that viewpoint and representing the laws of the state of Texas that, that we believe in, that people of our state have elected our representatives to do. The Texas law known as SB8 bans abortions as soon as a fetal heartbeat is detected, which can be as early as six weeks before most women know they're pregnant. While there are exceptions for medical emergencies, there are none for rape or incest. No Texas executive official enforces SB8 either, and so no Texas executive official may be enjoined. To allow Texas' scheme to stand would provide a roadmap for other states to abrogate any decision of this court with which they disagree. But the Supreme Court's focus is on the law's enforcement mechanism, a first of its kind that empowers private citizens, not state officials, to sue anyone from an Uber driver to a doctor who helps a woman get the procedure. This position is accepted here. The theory of the amicus brief is that it can be easily replicated in other states that disfavor uh, other constitutional rights. I'm wondering if in a defensive posture in state court, the constitutional defense can be fully aired. The Supreme Court is expected to announce its decision sometime before the end of the year. 
Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. A body found near the Blue Star Art Complex. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office isn't ready to release the name of a man whose partially submerged body was discovered along the San Antonio River. That call came in about 1130 this morning as a probable drowning. But SAPD says the situation was being treated as a potential crime scene pending a ruling by the medical examiner. From what officers could tell initially, they say there was no obvious trauma to the body, but they say they want to know what may have led up to that body being in the river. We are going to handle this as we do every investigation with a very um, utmost care to make sure that it's looked into. It gathered at the scene were those who appeared to be the victim's family and friends. The discovery unnerving for those who often walk or run along that part of the San Antonio River or who frequent the Blue Star in Southtown, which is popular among locals and tourists. A man is in the hospital after showing up to what he thought was a party, but instead he was robbed and shot. This happened around 2 a.m. on the north side of the Tuscany Park Apartments. That's off of Patricia Street, not far from West Avenue and Blanco Road. When police arrived, they found that man in the breezeway of the building with a gunshot wound to the back. He was taken to University Hospital. Police still looking for whoever pulled the trigger. A man facing charges after police say he shot a man in two separate incidents with the last incident from back in July turning fatal. 52 year old Alejandro Isaac facing a suspicion of murder charge for the death of Rudolph Alderete. The fatal shooting happened at an illegal gaming room. Police say cell phone video shows Alderete walking up to Isaac in an attempt to shake his hand, but Isaac allegedly shoots him several times instead. Police also believe he was shot by Isaac in April, which was also captured on video. Originally, Isaac claimed self-defense in the gambling room shooting. His bond is set at $175,000. As a series of community advisory committees begin to take a look at the city's next $1.2 billion bond program, a long-awaited Southside project could be in the mix. A police station in District 3. Garrett Berger tells us more about the $19 million proposal. The Diamond Food Mart sits in the heart of District 3. Thank you. Good one. At South New Braunfels and Hot Wells. 183. Donor Outbag, a police substation would be a welcome addition to the district. It's a big neighborhood. We need a police station here around, so we'll be safe, you know. Taking up most of the southeast corner of San Antonio, D3 does not have a substation of its own. Instead, police coverage is split between the east and south substations. So what that means is we don't have our own property crime team. We don't have our own safe officers. Phyllis Villagran is D3's freshman councilwoman. But a district substation was a longtime dream of her sister Rebecca Villagran, who held the seat before her. And the new councilwoman has high hopes for it. I'm hoping we're going to be able to address our domestic violence issues and our property crime issues in, in the district. It's not a guarantee. A community advisory committee will recommend a list of projects for council to approve and send to voters. And there's more to adding a substation than just a building. SAPD's Public Information Office told KSAT in part in an emailed statement, quote, should the community identify a police substation as a project to be included and the bond subsequently approved by voters, the department would need additional personnel to staff that facility, meaning the city council would likely need to talk about expanding its police department at a time when that's become a highly charged issue. The Citizens Advisory Committee for the facilities portion of the bond program will be meeting Thursday. Like all other meetings for the bond, it'll be open to the public. In District 3, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Worst Fest, back just in time for its 60th anniversary. This year is extra special because it's the first time since the pandemic and since that massive fire that destroyed the Market Platz building. That, for, that fire broke out just days after the festival ended back in 2019. Fire officials declared a total loss due to smoke and heat damage, but this year the new building is supposed to be better than ever. You can get a first-hand look at the new building right now on KSAT.com. By the way, the festival begins on Friday. A celebration of the sausage. Oh, isn't that amazing? <laughs> so I love it. I just love it. It's going to be mm. nice to have it back. And the weather? 
I think it's going to it's going to play out nicely as well here, Adam. Uh, it looks like it will. Now we do have a cold front coming in the middle of this week, so we will have jacket weather all day by Thursday. Just keep that in the back of your mind. I want to touch on this. The aquifer down a touch today, a tenth of a foot, but we're at 666.8. That's exactly average for the month of November, but the 10 day average is above the trigger point for stage one restrictions. Long story short, stage one restrictions being lifted starting tomorrow. So back to year round watering rules. Pollen count, just ragweed and mold, both considered low today. Temperatures now 70s to low 80s, 83 Pleasanton and Stinson, 81 Divine, 77 Canyon Lake and Bulverde. And as we go through the evening, temperatures gradually making their way through the 60s. Some fog developing tomorrow morning. Tomorrow's going to be a lot like today. Then the big and noticeable changes. I'll detail those coming up. Thank you, Adam. It's officially here. Day of the Dead and Ofrendas are on display all over the Alamo City. Why the one at the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center holds a special meaning for its director. And November is Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Coming up next, we'll tell you about some breakthroughs happening now with research that could help people affected. Welcome back. Here's what we're working out for you tonight on the Night Beat at 10. That's right. A San Antonio police officer was fired for beating a woman who was already in custody. Part of that incident captured on police body cam and the woman in handcuffs, listen to this, was six months pregnant at the time. Now tonight, the defenders are going to speak to that woman's attorney and they uncovered the officer's history of violence towards people in custody. And speeding concerns in our community. Dash cam video captures what police in Castle Hill say is a growing problem. We're going to take a look at how they plan to tackle this issue. We're going to have those stories and so much more coming up on the night. Myra, back to you. All right. Thank you, Steve and Steph. November is Alzheimer's Awareness Month. All year long, though, researchers are working to find out why it affects some people, but not others. And sometimes that leads to breakthroughs to understand the disease better. As our Ursula Perry reports, three of them could save millions of lives. Every 60 seconds, someone in the United States develops Alzheimer's disease. There is a huge need for new Alzheimer's disease treatments. One major breakthrough in the lab, a blood test. It predicts the onset of Alzheimer's 20 years before the symptoms occur. It works by detecting the buildup of microscopic clumps of amyloid plaques in the brain. So these clumps kind of break up the communication between our neurons that are needed for us to think and remember and do things that we normally do. Researchers from Washington University School of Medicine report that when the amyloid levels are combined with age and a gene variant, brain changes can be identified with 94% accuracy. But that's not all. Now they're working to create a blood test to determine the presence of tangles that occur after Alzheimer's symptoms appear. So when people do have subtle memory problems, we can tell whether is it really due to Alzheimer's disease or is it likely due to some other cause. These simple blood tests could be available during a regular doctor's visit within two years, bypassing the need for expensive tests and procedures. We can send as many people as we want to get a blood test and they can get it that day. Another breakthrough uses antibodies to alert the immune system to the presence of plaques and directs immune cells to remove them. When we administer it to mouse models that develop this disease, it removes these plaques from the brain and from the blood vessels. Back in June, the FDA approved the first new drug for Alzheimer's in 18 years. Out of helm targets the amyloid plaques in the brain and also may slow down cognitive decline. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 right now, flying high above the Pearl. Beautiful day after a beautiful weekend. First full week of November. You know, and we got some weather November like so tomorrow. beautiful this weekend. Yeah, I mean the parade was great on Friday night. Perfect weather Halloween. Perfect weather on mm -hmm. Sunday. Let's just keep this going, Adam. Let's keep the trend going. Yeah. Another week. Another cold front. We're lining them up just about weekly right now. And this one's going to be pretty noticeable. I'm going to get right to the chase here and tell you that Thursday is a day where you'll want to have a jacket handy all day long, not just in the morning, but all day long. Look at our high temperatures and what we're expecting. We'll be near 80 again tomorrow, near 70 on Wednesday. And then our afternoon high temperatures should be in the upper 50s 
by Thursday. So that's the warmest we would get all day on Thursday it would be about 58 to you know, right near 60 degrees. So you're going to notice the changes later on. Let's talk about the front. It's actually just off to the north of us in North Texas right now. It's just sitting there and it's going to sit there through tomorrow, then gradually move our way on Wednesday. Some cooler temperatures behind it, but only in the 60s right now in the Panhandle. Amarillo 63, Lubbock at 68. Then you go farther to the north, temperatures get down into the 30s and 40s. Well, it's going to take a while for that cooler air to get here, but as I showed you, by Thursday, it's especially going to be in place. We still have some 80s outside now. Del Rio 83 along with Uvalde 87, Catula, Laredo 88 degrees. Meanwhile, Beeville 78 and 75 in Fredericksburg. We talked about the afternoon high temperatures really taking a dive, especially for Thursday. Mornings, however, aren't going to take as much of a hit uh, as you would expect with this kind of a cold front. So we'll have the next couple of days. The mornings will be right near 60 degrees. By Thursday through Saturday, it's back down into the mid 40s. So we're not looking at anything noticeably cooler for the nights and mornings when you compare it to the previous cold front that set the stage for the 40s every morning this weekend. And dew points, of course, will be affected. Right now we've got a little bit of humidity back in the air. Dew points right near 60. It's not all that noticeable. It's not oppressive. It still feels nice outside, but there's a hint of humidity in the air the next couple of days. Then we get to Thursday through the weekend. It's going to be another weekend, end of the week, weekend where we sweep away the humidity and it feels pleasant and crisp outside, especially that fall like feel in the air at sunrise and sunset. So there's our system we were talking about. There's a stationary boundary that will gradually make it here throughout the day on Wednesday. Right now, really not a lot of shower thunderstorm activity along that and here I'm not expecting a whole lot other than just some areas of drizzle and off and on showers periodically not tomorrow tomorrow Tuesday morning we start off with some areas of fog break into a little bit of sunshine by the afternoon and then once we get into tomorrow night so we're talking early Wednesday morning through, through the morning commute as well areas of drizzle reduce visibility, fog, low clouds, and then some sprinkles and light showers coming and going throughout the day on Wednesday and especially Wednesday night into the very early morning hours on Thursday. So no rain chance is really the next uh, day and a half, but once we get to Tuesday night and especially into Wednesday, that's when we see that 60% chance of scattered to widespread at that point. If we're lucky, we could squeeze out a half to three quarters of an inch in a few spots over that about 36 hour time frame. So this evening comfortable, not much of a breeze out there. Southeasterly at about three to eight miles per hour. Fog developing well after midnight and especially around sunrise. So expect that for your morning commute. And then we'll have some sunshine in the afternoon from near 60 in the morning to upper 70s, right near 80 later on in the day in a southeasterly breeze at five to 10. So tomorrow looking and feeling a lot like today. But here are those changes again. Get ready for them. We talked about the enhanced rain chances Wednesday on into Wednesday night. Not only that, the wind's going to pick up as well. So it's going to become gusty as that cooler air moves in. Usually the cooler air moving in and winds go hand in hand, and this will be no exception. And then by the weekend, we rebound. A lot of sunshine back into the 70s. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. I have a thought. Hmm. You know, usually college professors get tenure. Yes. Right. UTSA's. Head football coach just got a 10 year. Yes, he sure did. <laughs> $28 million. And I'll tell you what, he could have actually made more money had he gone to Texas Tech. But I believe he decided to stay here and continue what he started. So. And that is a winning culture. When we come back, trailer talks about staying at UTSA and why he chose to sign up for another 10 years. And the Astros survive <laughs> to play another day coming up. was the scene at UTSA on Sunday when Athletic Director Dr. Lisa Campos announced to the team that head coach Jeff Trailer had just signed a contract extension that will keep him at UTSA through 2031. So a 10-year deal for $28 million averages out to $2.8 million a season with a $7.5 million buyout, which decreases each year. It also includes more money for assistant coaches and staff. Moves like this uh, make sure boosters, alumni, recruits, our fans, know how committed I am, our staff is, but also how committed UTSA is and President Amy and Dr. Campos and our boosters and our Board of Regents. Now the 16th ranked Roadrunners can focus on their next challenge against UTEP at El Paso this Saturday at 9.15 p.m. See if they can go 9-0.
Texas Longhorns have now lost three games in a row on a drop to four and four on the season and just two and three in the Big 12, taking them out of any shot at the conference championship. Now, the latest collapse coming out of a bye week was to Baylor, who after getting out to a 21 to 10 lead, the Horns fell apart again, allowing the Bears to score 21 unanswered points in the 31 24 defeat in the three losses to Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. Now, Baylor UT has been outscored 75 27 in the second half. There's never been a great triumph without a, without a struggle. You know, at some point, if you, if to, to triumph and to do something special, you have to struggle. And, and clearly, we're in the midst of the struggle. Um, and the only way to, to get over that hump and to get through it is, is to have grit and determination and perseverance um, and ultimately break through. The Longhorns now have to go on the road for a tough test against Iowa State. It is also coming off a loss to West Virginia. The Horns will be six and a half point underdogs in the 6.30 p.m. kickoff. White Texas Aggies return to action following their bye week, and they have a tough one at home this Saturday. That's when 13th-ranked Aggies host the 12th-ranked Auburn Tigers. The Tigers are coming off a 31-20 victory over Ole Miss on Saturday to improve to 6-2 overall, 3-1 in the SEC, compared to the Aggies' 6-2 overall record, 3-2 in conference play. The Aggies go into this game as four-point favorites. With four games left of the regular season on a three-game win streak, what can we expect to see from the Maroon and Whites? We know that we still can do some amazing things, and we see how good of a team that we can be. Even even as as much as higher we are right now, like um, we haven't reached our full potential, and we know that. So we're working on that every week to get better. All right, kick off at Kyle Field on Saturday, set for 2:30, just one day before the NFL trade deadline. Former Aggie Von Miller has been traded to the Super Bowl contending Los Angeles Rams this after 10 seasons in Denver for second and third round picks in 2022. The Houston Astros live to play another day. That's after they were able to beat the Braves in Atlanta in Game Five last night, nine to five. They had to claw their way back to get there. The Braves struck in the first inning when Adam Duvall belted with this grand slam home run to push the Braves out to the early four to nothing lead. But to the Astros' credit, they chipped their way back to tie it for all. Then in the fifth or inning, Marwin Gonzalez delivered this pinch hint single that scored two, and the Astros never looked back, taking in any chance of the Braves winning their first World Series in 26 years at home. Off the table, game six back in Houston tomorrow night. I didn't know if they could pull it off last night, but they did. Ended a win streak for the Braves there. Yes, sure yeah. did. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Our Q&A is up next. She is an epidemiologist, which means she is a disease detective, and she has been with us really from the beginning of this pandemic, helping us work through some of the technicalities that we see out there. Sharice Royale-Agrini is with the San Antonio AIDS Foundation, but we are leaning on her expertise as an epidemiologist and what she sees with some of the vaccines and the booster shots that are out there. Sharice, it was thought that we would get approval for kids 12 and younger before Halloween. Obviously, that hasn't happened. Should people be concerned that the approval for the younger vaccine for approval for the vaccine for younger kids hasn't happened yet? I think it should make people feel more confident. Uh, the reason it's been delayed a little bit longer than we had hoped is because they're spending so much time really looking at all the possibilities. We want to be absolutely sure that this vaccine is safe in kids so you can feel confident that when the vaccine is released, which I hope to be any day now, uh, that it will be the safest it can be for kids. Are you expecting the CDC to sign off saying that all kids between that age range 5 to 11 should get the vaccine? Or are we looking at a situation where maybe certain kids with certain health conditions uh, should go first, essentially? Well, I can't 100 percent predict what the CDC is going to say tomorrow, but I think what they'll say is that um, every child um, between the ages of 5 and 11 should get vaccinated, just like everyone over 12 should get vaccinated. But certainly if you're immunocompromised, you have other health risks that's going to make you more likely to get very sick from COVID, you should be first in line. I doubt that they're going to be gatekeeping. I think that there's enough vaccine out there that that's not necessary, but there's going to be a strong push to encourage kids at higher risk to get vaccinated first. We're hearing some of the same concerns from people out there about what we heard from the earlier vaccines and even boosters. The, the concerns that uh, specifically that this would affect their children's fertility down the line. Any evidence that that's true? 
Absolutely no evidence whatsoever. And I will tell you that with every vaccine out there, the um, anti-vax group tends to talk about fertility. That's that's a big uh, fear factor that's used. And it's been used with every vaccine that we have. And to date, we don't have any vaccine that causes fertility problems. I, for, I know people are concerned that this is a new vaccine, but we've given millions of doses worldwide, and we've not seen any difference whatsoever in fertility problems in males or females. And we are still seeing, of course, people who have received the vaccine, they have gotten pregnant, they have had healthy deliveries, healthy babies, and women who are pregnant, they are being told at any time during your pregnancy, get the vaccine. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we've seen much higher risk of hospitalization and death in women that are pregnant and get COVID if they're not vaccinated. All the more reason to get vaccinated uh, while you're pregnant or if you're anticipating getting pregnant. Um, everybody should get vaccinated regardless. And we have so much data now that we feel pretty confident in saying that there's not an additional risk to fertility um, or to the fetus if you're pregnant. Is there anything down the line that bothers that that concerns you? Is there a different variant that's out there that's that's getting traction in different parts of the country or different parts of the there's, world, I should say? Right. There's been some concern in the UK with the sort of Delta Plus variant. Um, it doesn't look to be any worse than what we've already been dealing with. So that's good news. Um, yes, there can be another variant coming up. The way to really slow it down is if we can get vaccinated, we can get ahead of it. That doesn't mean it's going to stop the variant, but it's going to make it much harder for any other variants to spread through a population. We are not going to get to COVID zero. What we want to get is to a low enough level below a threshold that we can manage and we can stop outbreaks. And we can do that really through vaccination across for the whole population. I always like talking to you because you're looking at all the data and breaking it down for us and the trends that we've seen throughout this pandemic. So are you anticipating that we will see another winter surge like we did this time last year? You know, if we continue to take the precautions we're taking, and I know everybody's tired of wearing masks and we really want to rip those masks off, um, that's really helped us a lot. It's also helped us stop the flu. And by stopping the flu and slowing down COVID, we can free up hospital space. And that really helps us in controlling the, the pandemic as well as uh, outbreaks of other diseases. So it's really important that we uh, that we're sorry, my phone is ringing. No problem. That we continue, <laughs> that we uh, continue um, to to vaccinate to get ahead of it and continue those precautions. I, I'm going to say we should wear masks at least for the next few months. I know it's very tempting as case rates go down to stop those precautions, um, but unfortunately, uh, we need to keep up those precautions. Imagine not putting out a fire completely and walking away from it. Um, we can't do that with COVID. We have to stay in front of it. What's your message to parents that are out there that that are weighing whether they want to get their five to 11 year old vaccinated? I want to give you the, the last the last word here about what you would say to them that are that are, you know, I mean, out there wondering they hear about myocarditis. They hear about fertility. They hear about all these different things. I will say that the risk of any adverse reaction to the vaccine is extremely low, even in five to 11 year olds. And the risk of complications if you get COVID is high enough that I will absolutely vaccinate my 11 year old. We are counting down the days till he can get vaccinated. Um, I will say that if anybody has any questions, please contact a health professional, contact one of us. Um, we're really happy to talk to you about your specific questions. I think it's always impactful when we hear from professionals like yourself, people in the medical field who are saying, my child will be getting vaccinated. So absolutely. Disease detective and mom, Sharice Rohr Allegrini, thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you very much for having me. Always appreciate your time. Thank you, Sharice. We'll be right back. People in our community continuing to honor loved ones who have passed away today. The official start of Dia de los Muertos. Many are contributing to community of friendas. One of those altars is at the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. As Max Massey shows us what this means to the director of the center is hard to explain. My mama just passed away uh, this June of a stroke. Dia de los Muertos is a special time for Graciela Sanchez 
especially this year. My aunt, she did actually die of COVID. More than 4,000 people have passed away locally from COVID. Clearly, it has been so tough for so many families in and around San Antonio. We're offering uh, an opportunity this year uh, to showcase uh, community altars by the people from this community. Such a powerful community altar right here at the corner. Take a look, dozens of pictures of friends and family. It is open to the public 24 seven. You can put pictures of your loved ones up until November 8th. Locally in the West Side or if they're passing by on Guadalupe Street are invited to bring images, make copies. We don't want originals, but place them on the community altar and it'll be up for a week so we can honor those who have passed away. Pictures and pictures to honor those who have passed, but other elements with special significance as well. Having water, having salt, uh, having fire, so candles, maybe some incense. The marigolds bring uh, the smells out so that the spirits know and are attracted to the altar. We wanna keep up a tradition and not just commercialize Day of the Dead. Already through the day, we saw more and more community members showing up and taking part. As for Graciela, she is soaking in the time of remembrance. Everything I do, I just keep on saying, okay, this is what she taught me. This is what I learned from her, and I am continuing to keep those traditions, her values constantly with me. And I hope that one day I grow to be as a, a wonderful human being as she was. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. In honor of her mother. I love that community remembrance. And that's beautiful. A, that's the thing. It's 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 cultural. It's community, but it's also very personal. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Live look outside. 6:40 tonight, and uh, you know. I'm enjoying this weather mm -hmm. at Casco. Hey, we're getting into just a fall like stretch of weather, and we will see temperatures more of the same tomorrow, but then the dive comes, and that's with the cold front for the middle part of the week. Right now we're at 77. By 8 o'clock, near 70 degrees. By midnight, we'll be in the mid 60s. Not a huge and drastic temperature drop tonight. We'll start the day tomorrow right near 60. The cold front's gradually going to move through on Wednesday. Get ready for jacket weather all day on Thursday. I'm going to tell you how much cooler it's going to get in just a bit. In the buzz today, one Pennsylvania boy decided to use the candy collecting holiday that is Halloween to exact some sweet revenge of sorts. 12 year old Charlie Bull still recovering after being attacked by a crocodile at a vacation resort in Mexico. Now the resort says they've taken steps to prevent attacks from happening again. Well, Charlie and his friends used his experience for a cathartic candy cash in on Halloween, crafting a giant crocodile costume that was 16 feet long for trick or treating. All right, it's as easy as a jump to the left and a step into a movie theater to get the Rocky Horror Picture Show back on the box office charts. Some might feel they're in a time warp <laughs> after seeing it back in theaters 46 years after its release. According to the rap, Disney, which now owns the rights to the movie, says Halloween weekend screenings brought in about $250,000 in ticket sales. Disney owns everything. Midnight yeah, yeah. screenings of the cold classic have been around for decades. This extends the longest theatrical run in movie history. Kraft Mac and Cheese fans are drooling over a chance to test out some new flavors. The company is introducing an exclusive flavors club where members can be the first to try out Kraft's new seasoning blends before they're released out into stores. Members also get access to clothing based on the flavors, <laughs> like a hoodie for ranch, a jacket for pizza, and a sports jersey for buffalo. Yeah, Kraft hoodie and cheese. <laughs> Becoming a member is a multi-step process that includes signing up on Kraft's website, then acting on social media drops. Mm -hmm. It's all about social media. All right, it's best friend is sugar. You'll find it in sweet and savory foods, breakfast foods, dinner, dessert. We're celebrating today because it is National Cinnamon Day. Pumpkin spice, nothing without cinnamon. Who wants to eat a cereal <laughs> called just Toast Crunch instead of tin Cinnamon Toast Crunch? Not me. No wonder it's often the most purchased of all holiday spices. <laughs> all right, Kasky, I hope you're listening. Cinnamon listening. Big Day is all thanks to McCormick and Company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the that's the spice company. Makes sense, right?
Yeah. They started this thing up in 2019. And all Those we cinnamon do, rolls look good. That's all I'm saying. Well, all we do here is encourage the behavior of making these days by, by <laughs> various <laughs> countries and big or c companies and big industries. Bunch, is that what we're doing, or are we are we irritating here. our meteorologist friend by bringing up these days? Uh, it, may, it may be a twofer. I think yeah. We're enablers is what it is. That's no, all I'm saying. I think we're really, we're clearly irritating you, and I think that's that's a good thing. I know. You guys love it. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was the youngest of three, so I got all that when I was a kid, right? They, oh, oh they knew how to press those buttons. Did you ever have the cinnamon roll and chili thing? Uh, cinnamon roll and cinnamon chili. Roll and chili. Like chili. at school, that was a lunch. Cinnamon, cinnamon roll rolls and chili together. Is this it's a, a thing. An Iowa I, it's, it must be a Midwest I was thing. You say it's slow Iowa clap for Southwest thing. Iowa, right there. Yeah. <laughs> Cinnamon rolls and chili together. Like it's was a, that like it's, a big popular day? It's a it's a winter thing. Ah. Like hmm. in homes and at school. I just remember the frenzy of enchilada day. Yeah. See, we that didn't was, have that. Yeah. I know that's hard to believe. We didn't have that in enchilada Iowa. Enchilada day was yeah. a that was a big day. Yeah. No, it wasn't Taco Tuesday. It was like Taco One Day all year, right? Um, <laughs> another cold front's headed toward us this week, and it's going to be a bigger temperature drop, especially in terms of afternoon highs. You'll want to have a jacket ready for the entire day on Thursday. Midweek rain chances as well, Wednesday on into Wednesday night with the approaching cold fronts. Let's get right to it. This is what we'd call a noticeable too strong. OK, it's kind of kind of right on the edge of noticeable and strong here because our afternoon temperatures will go from near 80, upper 70s, near 80 down into the upper 50s for a brief period later this week. Morning temperatures aren't going to take as much of a hit. They'll just be back down into the 40s like they were over the weekend and late last week. So right now we're 77, dew point of 58. The wind's coming off the Gulf of Mexico, so there's a subtle hint of humidity back in the air. It's hard to even notice it and feel it, uh, but that's going to be swept away by Wednesday night. So the front is actually parked over North Texas right now. Abilene, Midland, low 70s, get into the 60s up in the Panhandle and then farther north up the Plains, up in temperatures down in the 30s. This front will stay to the north of us tomorrow. Wednesday, it'll gradually start pushing southward and it's going to be a fairly shallow cold front that's going to move through. So the depth of the cold air is going to be fairly narrow, which is going to mean some low clouds hanging around on the back side of it. And let's talk temperatures now. We're already still 87 in Catula, 83 in Del Rio, 81 in Pleasanton. We have several 80s out there. And by tomorrow afternoon, right near 90 degrees south and west of town. I mean, Laredo probably 90, Catula 87, Carrizo Springs 86, Del Rio into the mid 80s. But you get into the hill country and we'll have high temperatures tomorrow in the mid 70s. Even Stone Oak about 79, 81 Lavernia, Castroville 80 degrees and 78 tomorrow in Holotus. But look what happens. We get to Wednesday near 70 for most of us. Thursday, low clouds, dampness in the morning, uh, gusty north wind. We'll drop our temperatures down into the upper 50s. So upper 50s near 60. That's as warm as it's going to get all day on Thursday. So prepare for that jacket weather the entire day. Not much real shower or thunderstorm activity along this boundary. Uh, it's it's really displaced away from it right now. But as it moves into our neck of the woods with that hint of mugginess in the air, we'll have some fog again tomorrow morning around a fog in the morning. A little bit of afternoon sunshine. No real rain chances during the day tomorrow. It's tomorrow night through basically off and on all of Wednesday. This is noon here. We'll have some drizzle. We'll have a few sprinkles out there and we'll have some hit or miss light showers. And even Wednesday night, early Thursday, we're anticipating some scattered activity. And if we're lucky, we could squeeze out maybe a half to three quarters of an inch of rain throughout that entire period of time. So we're not talking the big heavy downpours uh, that we sometimes see around here with the tropical air. It's not going to be that way, but rain chances peak and spike Wednesday through Wednesday night. We've got them at 60%. Tomorrow, more of the same near 60 in the morning, upper 70s by the afternoon, morning fog giving way to some afternoon sunshine and then get ready for a gray sky Wednesday through Thursday. And those temperatures, they're taking a dive, but we rebound into the weekend, sunny 70s, low humidity still. By the way, Adam, I'm reading something called The Truth About Chili and Cinnamon Rolls. Oh, I'm, I'm it, all ears. It is a thing. It's a Midwestern thing. Indeed. I've now learned. It'll probably have a day before you know it now. I think it should. <laughs> In case you missed it, coming up next.
One person is dead after a shooting at a Halloween party up in Texarkana. Officials say the suspect has now turned himself in. The 21 year old man now charged with aggravated assault and additional charges are pending. Police say the suspect opened fire in a crowd of nearly 200 people on Sunday around midnight. One person was taken to a hospital where he later died. Nine others were hurt in that shooting. We have some new details this noon of a deadly crash. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office now identifying the victim as 59 year old David Anthony Prue. Police say that on Friday night, Prue was hit by a driver on Fredericksburg Road near Vance Jackson. Police say he was pronounced dead at the scene. The driver headed south on Fredericksburg Road following that crash, and officers are still looking for that person. Day after he was shot at a fast food drive through overnight, San Antonio police say the man was at the Whataburger on Autry Pond Road. That's no near Bull Verde and Jones Maltzberger. He was with a friend. He was showing her his gun, and while they were waiting in line, she accidentally fired it, hitting the man in the arm. He was taken to the hospital and is expected to be okay. This year, things won't just look different, they'll sound different too. We've changed the direction of the big tent so it faces towards the market plots. And so it gives you kind of an amphitheater type uh, feel to it. Music will radiate into this area. Music, food, drinks, mixed with the support from the community is what makes Worst Fest come together. It runs November 5th through the 14th. You can read more about Worst Fest and how to support at ksat.com. Tomorrow's going to be a lot like today. Get ready for some dampness off and on on Wednesday, then breezy and cooler Wednesday night, especially into Thursday. Jacket weather all day Thursday. All right. Thank you, Adam. And thank you for watching. See you on the night beat at 10.